Hello. I, uh, yeah, yeah. that's your yeah. name. Squirrels got me. Big Jim. Yeah. <laughs> Cold and fun. That's good that you think of that of it because that's what deer hunting typically is, is cold and fun. Yeah. <laughs> Yesterday morning I'm blasting up on the pass and I see these deer moving. And I'm like, ooh, there's some deer moving. All of a sudden I just see this person just head down, just hauling ass wearing shorts and a t-shirt with a pack on. And I'm like I'm like, is that hard? My dad always talks about floating through the woods like the autumn breeze. So so Robert's when you're two hundred and seventy five pounds, I don't know how you do that, but the Freightliner? <laughs> it's just like a creeper. He's just kind of up in the corner watching what's going on down there. Yeah. You know? He's like... <laughs> you know, he's up there slapping and pissing all over everything. Is it warm yet? <laughs> How did you know the name of the actor? That's right. I know. Why did you say his name? Her Hervé Velichos. <laughs> <laughs> you know what Pertinier means? If you know what Pertinier means and you live in America, you're a redneck too. <laughs> Welcome to the Log Talk Podcast, brought to you by Pertnir Outdoors. All right, welcome back, you fellow Pertnir Outdoors fans. Thank you for tuning in for another episode. It is Thursday night, and I am cutting in a really quick intro here for you. Uh, you've heard enough of me talking about uh, the beer event, and this Sunday is the... Uh, is the big day so we're pretty excited we're looking at a weather forecast that knock on wood could not be any better it looks like we're going to be clear sailing heading into sunday so we if you're not aware we are doing a uh, a fundraiser event for the national deer association and the venison donation coalition uh, which is uh, if you're not familiar with venison donation it is a program that helps pay venison processors here locally in new york to process deer that are donated and that meat goes directly to food pantries so now more than ever we know that there's a lot of people in need and uh this is uh something that we are very passionate about which is feeding them so we've got our beer which is uh not ironically named uh pert near beer for feeding them and we are going to be raising some money with this event on sunday as we release the beer so starting uh the event's going to run about noon to five. Um, hope to, uh, I, I know we're, we're going to have people showing up or before noon, they open up at 11. So anytime really that you want to show up anytime between 11 and five, uh, we will be there and the event will be happening. We've got, uh, we've got some great raffle items, some awesome, uh, products that were either sold to us at a discount or given as the donations towards this raffle. Um, our big, our big raffle items, what we're doing, we're selling, uh, we're playing, we call them a card game. So we've got a poster board with 50 playing cards on them. We removed the two jokers. And uh, so those two uh, card games that we're doing, one is for a CVA Acura LR muzzle loader, which is a badass 50 cal muzzle loader. Uh, you can go online and search that if you're so inclined. But we're raffling that off, and it's twenty dollars a chance, and we're only selling fifty. Um, so as soon as those fifty are gone, we will draw the winner of that gun, and that will probably trigger us to start doing some new raffles for guns and uh, items of such. The uh, guys from the Deer Association, Sean Burdick, uh, he will be up with some banners. Uh, they call them a banner raffle. So as soon as that one's gone and we sell the muzzle loader, we will go right on to the banner raffles and start doing them. Um, and we'll probably play card games with that as well. So we'll sell a limited number of chances. And once we sell all the chances, we will pick a winner. And those banners are pretty cool because you can select a multitude of different prizes off of the banner. Uh, basically, it's a little uh, poster board that has a whole bunch of different items that are all in that value range, and you pick what you want. So those... Uh, that's kind of the, the card game aspect. The other card game we're going to have, uh, which is the other main raffle item, is a um, is a youth lifetime hunting license for here in New York, uh, $375 value, and that is being donated by the Greater Rochester chapter of the donation co of, uh, of, well, sorry, 
from the Greater Rochester Chapter of the Deer Association as, as well as the Venison Donation Coalition. They are donating that. Um, so that's a great opportunity. Last year we had a guy win it who um, was very excited. He was at the event and uh, and won and gave that uh, gave that to his grandson. So uh, if you have a youngster that you want to give it to, that's awesome. If not, you can use that to apply towards uh, towards a lifetime license for yourself. That three hundred seventy five dollars. So those are the are the two main card card games we're going to do. Um, when we get down to the basket raffles, I've got. You know, I, I really wanted to have this all put together to kind of explain to everyone, but just kind of high level uh, reviewing some of the items we've got for the basket raffle. I've got um, a lot of product from Buck Fever Synthetics. Uh, Troy hooked us up. We appreciate that and his continued support. Um, over at Drapes Archery, I picked up a Tacticam, the new Tacticam Reveal X Pro, I think is what it's called. Uh, which officially goes on sale August 1st. Um, Jesse hooked me up with that, so thank you so much to Jesse over at Drapes uh, Archery for for doing that for us. Um, Another local archery shop, FLX Outdoor Sports. Uh, I stopped in there last week, and Cliff hooked me up with with an actual bow, um, a bear archery bow. It's the Bear Resurgence. It's a 31-inch axle-to-axle-to-axle, 60-pound draw weight. Uh, It's a, it's a, it's a bare bow. Um, so I went to the hunt works and picked up a, uh, all of the accessories that you need for that bow. And, uh, so that bow will be ready to shoot and will come with a, uh, come with a target as well. So that'll be one of the baskets. Um, and, uh, we got, we got a tree stand and sticks from the hunt works. We got that. Um, and a lot of other, uh, trinkets that will be thrown in there. We got a couple golf baskets. So, um, and 18 holes at uh, Ironwood and 18 holes at Burncliff and some goodies to go along with that. So um, the list goes on and on, and I'm, those are kind of some of the main items. We're going to be dropping, the, dropping a lot of uh, miscellaneous stuff in the baskets with them and uh, some great value to these basket raffles, and those will be the classic, uh, you know, you buy a sheet of tickets and you, you tear them off and throw them in the bag. So that's the uh, that's kind of the, the long and the short of it. I think what we'll do is we'll try to have all of the raffles drawn by about four o'clock to uh, so we can kind of wrap up the actual um, raffle portion of it, and then you know people can just hang out and enjoy their time. Um, we've got we're going to have kind of a real kind of a real fun setup in the back there at Windy Brew. Um, we've got I posted a video on the Instagram so you can kind of see what the layout's going to be, but we're going to have uh, the Whitetail Company uh, merch trailer is going to be there. Um, and then next to them will be the DJ, uh, DJ Tommy B, uh, which is, uh, a good friend of ours was at the, he's a, he drove school bus for my dad, my mom, and, uh, he's a great guy. So he'll be spinning the tunes and then we'll have Ben Williams and, uh, and Dallas, uh, will also be there, um, to officially score antlers. So that's something that if you have a, a mount that you would like to get officially scored, um, bring them uh it doesn't have to be a mount it could be a euro it could be a a full head mount it could be um christ if you got a full body mount bring that thing that'd be fun uh or some sheds so dallas is officially um certified to score for new york big buck club and ben is certified to score for the northeast big buck club so you can uh get your horn scored by both of those guys if uh if uh if you got the if you got the bone and you can make the book, they can uh, take care of that for you. So, um, very excited about this weekend's event, and we very much hope that uh, that you will join us and uh, partake in the fun festivities. And if you can't make it, the beer will. Uh, we made a massive batch this year, so it will be available for a little while. Um, so, if you need to get out to Windy Brew to get some, or you need some help getting it to you, reach out to us and let let us know. So think that's all i'm gonna give you a fun chat this week with dan ladd the editor from new york outdoor news so enjoy the chat we talk a lot of current events and some of the the gun legislation and the things that are going on here in new york and things that we can all do to kind of try to get involved in our local conservation scene so enjoy the chat have a great weekend and we hope to see you on sunday up at windy brew so we can feed them see ya microphones are hot see if we can we're uh sitting here at the adirondack welcome center on the uh north way here with dan ladd the out 
the uh, Outdoor News, New York Outdoor News Editor-in-Chief. Hello. So welcome back to the podcast. This is your second time on. It is. And uh, trying to take advantage of for a few days for work and uh, figured I would reach out and see if I could connect with somebody in this area to do a podcast. And I was like, hey, Dan Ladd's first on my list because we've been trying <laughs> to get back together for a while, but it just hasn't happened. So thanks for connecting with me. Absolutely. Uh, just to tell folks where we are or if you drive up Interstate 87 north of Albany and you're heading for the Adirondacks, you'll cross the Hudson River. And right there on the right is the Adirondack Welcome, Welcome Center. And what is actually here is a very high-end boat washing station for invasive species that they opened up a couple of years ago. Okay. They have, I, I saw the sign that said it was closed today. Where but, is it, uh, around over here? It's just around the back corner okay. here behind the Welcome Center. Yeah, if you drive out, you can go buy it. But uh, it's pretty state-of-the-art. Uh, it's, it's can, they did a demonstration here, DEC did, when they opened it up a few years ago, and I came down for that, and it was, uh, it was pretty interesting. So the, the noise you folks hear in the background here is, trucks coming in and out this is a rest area yeah and it's very state-of-the-art uh, there's a lot here to inform you about the adirondacks if you're new to the area and you want to learn where theme parks are and hikes and anything along those lines so yeah as i'm i don't i've driven the north way 100 times going from you know thruway to albany and then up to saratoga mm-hmm. but i don't I, I never come up this far we're not that far from saratoga we're only right you know a couple exits up but um, you start to get up here and you sense the volume of traffic going north and south here, especially this time of year in July. It is it is yeah. oh, high yeah. impact time in the High Peaks area. Exit 18 is just above here, and that's in the town of Queensbury. Your next three or four exits are the Lake George area all the way to 22. And uh, then things kind of slim down a little bit. But uh, my wife and I were camping this past weekend. And the traffic was not bad, but, uh, you know, one of the things about that is it was the weekend after July 4th, Mm -hmm. and that typically is, I'm not going to say quiet, but it's quieter after July 4th. Things, there's just kind of like a little lull there. And uh, the reason I learned that from the mayor of Lake George, Bob Blaise, we actually had a a fishing tournament here on Lake George for a number of years called the King George Fishing Derby. In the first couple of years, we had it the weekend after July 4th because Bob felt that was a good weekend to do something around Lake George. It was kind of a quieter weekend. But mm-hmm. but that's all going to change here as we get into the heart of summer. It goes by quick. Yeah. It's a beautiful area, and, and people like to come here. It's uh, And I'm blessed to live here, too. I, I enjoy this part of, of New York State very much. And, of course, I love the Adirondacks. But uh, Yeah, it's you live in, a, in an absolutely beautiful area. And one thing I've noticed in my journey uh, coming into Saratoga County is the uh, kind of come up. I guess I came up through uh, Johnstown mm-hmm. and then over, uh, was that 29, I think? Correct. Um, and seeing that you guys are dealing with gypsy moths. Oh, up that, here that this area year. especially. Yeah. And this area as well. Uh, we It was last year and this year, like you said, they just missed my house by a half mile. I had a few, I was cleaning out a shed there a few weeks ago, and I found them in the, um, um, I can't remember the exact name of the word, but it's like a cocoon stage. Yeah. It looked like a leaf. It's after they've left the caterpillar stage, and I probably disposed of about 20 of them. But okay. uh, they didn't do any tree damage on my property, but literally a half mile down the road and a half mile to the west and much further as you come over this way. Yeah. Yeah. It's coming back now, but uh, I'll tell you something about that. We had it last year, and I have a hunting area that's in the northern part of Warren County here, and that area got hit hard last year. And, you know, we talked with DEC. There was a couple of uh, meetings that they had, a couple of, virtual meetings and the question I had and a few others had as well was how that might impact the mass crop as far as the oaks and they said well it probably will to some degree but it all depends on how well the leaves bounce back after the caterpillars have had their way with them and uh, I was up there three weeks ago mowing the lawn and it looked just like it might look around the first of May when turkey season starts the leaves were very small uh, well, a lot of them were eaten. Completely. So they yeah. bounced back. So I'm not sure. We had a tough year in their hunting last year because we didn't have the acorn crop. And it changed. The deer were around, but it changed where they were. And we were just starting to find them towards the end of the season. Things were getting better at the end of the season. And just starting to find the deer, right? Yeah, exactly. Because they, I, I'm a firm believer. I mean, we, we had two straight years in the Finger Lakes, um, especially in my, my area, which is like Canandaigua, Honeyoy, um, mm-hmm. over towards um, Canisius, Letchworth, that, those like three or four 
like valleys there just got freaking pounded. And even down into Steuben County. And they sprayed over there, right? In some of those some, areas. I think that's where they sprayed this year. They sprayed it? some, but but the good news is it appears that they've kind of gone through their cycle. The gypsy moths have. They kind of overstayed their welcome. They're kind of gone. Mm-hmm. Yeah, however that all works. And I'm, bacteria. Bacteria. Mm-hmm. And what I understand is that they get to a point where they're almost like overpopulated and mm-hmm. the bacteria. Mm-hmm. So I'm interested in, uh, I, got, I got a kid that, Tristan Fugel, he works for the DEC. Uh, he's a forester. So I got plans to get him on here. It's just a matter of coordinating schedules. But I'm interested to talk to them to, from the forestry end of it, you know, things that they're working on, things they're looking at. But, but we had, I mean, we had complete defoliation, like end of mm-hmm. June looked like you know you said may 1st like it looked like february 1st and up complete defoliation up until about two weeks ago here a lot of that especially the oak trees looked like that as you drove around and you looked up you saw bare trees and um getting back to our hunting area i'm concerned there that one particular spot because last year again we we had a tough year there and what it looked like in say late october early november we before we had some hard frost the leaves were very small. They were literally the size of a quarter, maybe bigger. Mm-hmm. And the ground, the leaves on the ground had spent so much time under the summer sun, they were almost gray. Yeah. It was, it was, it was weird, spooky right? looking. The it light was, was, yeah. weir- was weird. It was creepy. It was Even <laughs> driving right now, like when you drive past a patch of woods right now that should be foliated, but it's not, it, and there's all the light in the woods, mm-hmm. but you have all, it's just weird. It's just, all of it's weird. But I'm very much hoping that, you know, we're, we're optimistic that in our area that we're going to have, like, a bumper crop of acorns this year because it's been a couple of years that they've battled and haven't had a chance to. Mm-hmm. We've had no acorns in some areas for a couple of years. So the deer have, have had to move. That's, you know, to, back to your point, the deer have not been where the deer normally are. They're not acting the way they normally are because their primary food source is not there. We, we had one of the strangest things happen last year in our other hunting area, which did not get hit by gypsy moss but still the acorn crop was down a little bit um, sometimes it's based on elevation around here you can get say down to 700 800 feet in elevation and you might have some oaks that produce acorns you get up to 1200 1300 1500 the mountains in this area are more around 2000 2300 feet unlike the high peaks where they're 4000 feet but you might get up higher and not have those acorns well i found some acorns that i'm probably about 1500 feet and there was no deer sign there. I couldn't believe it. There was a couple of big, big scrapes and some really nice buck rubs, signpost rubs. Yeah. But you would think there would be other deer there, and there were not. No. And that was in mid-November. And, and those bucks were probably just making their annual loops mm-hmm. through those areas and checking those spots. And, and where they were, we're probably about a half a mile from there. We killed two bucks in there, and it was, uh, it's a cutover. It's on private land. And it joins up to state land, and it was it's a really thick area, and we changed it how we hunted a little bit. We were actually getting some of our watchers. We make deer drives. Our, some of our yep. watchers were getting a little too close to that. We realized they were bedding in there from some scouting we did last summer. We said, we got to back off of here and bring, keep our watchers back, let our drivers come through there and kick the deer out. Sure enough, we killed two beautiful bucks out of there. No kidding. Yeah. Out just of by, that. Just by changing that strategy. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, that, God, see, that's a whole podcast in itself because <laughs> we, like, we talk a lot internally, like, you know, we, and when I speak of that, like, the guys I hunt with, we talk a lot about our deer drives and that that we do, but um, the Adirondack, you know, culture of, of that is very similar to what mm-hmm. we do, and it's rich in, in history, and it doesn't really get talked about on podcasts. It just does you don't hear about it. You hear about all the archery strategy. You hear about tree stands. You hear about, you know, the tracking. Sure. Tracking has gotten super popular, but still like to me the most fun the most fun i have at this point in my hunting life is going out with my friends and exactly working in a coordinated effort to try to put a deer in front of somebody you, you hear that shot on the other end of the drive and you it just makes you smile yeah. and, and you wonder who shot and uh you hope that the result was good um i can tell you stories of every way when it didn't work out so well we had one last year but if you you want to save that conversation for this fall let's plan on it Uh, yeah i think we should circle back around to i I want to do that i want to make a point and maybe have a few of us on to you know just talk about strategies and tactics on on that sort of thing as we get closer to to hunting season um but we need to bookmark that we need to make it happen absolutely just you 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 say the word and and i'm there yeah (laughs) yeah with with technology now we that the summertime has become you have kids 
I do They're not. older. You don't. Okay. I do not. Well, it's freaking pure chaos when you get to. <laughs> I, I'm just. I'm living the life, and uh, so like my evenings, I was so regimented, all all winter, doing a podcast one night a week, eight o'clock, eight thirty. Now it's like freaking. There's. I don't have. I don't have a spare minute to myself during mm-hmm. the day. So I'm like escaping to for this work couple days away for work and i'm like that and i don't have kids i know yeah imagine <laughs> if you had somebody pulling at your pant leg wanting you to and it's always been like that it's yeah. not you know it's not because i work for outdoor news or anything like it's just i'm a, I'm a guy who likes to have my hands and things it's my own fault yeah really. That's, no uh, but it's uh, it's a it's a good life it's a good lifestyle sure. to have so we i wanted to and you and i had touched base it's probably a few months ago now the one thing that you had written an article that really that spurred me and i and i had reached out to you it was uh i think it was in your editor um in the editorial editorial okay. column there you were talking about uh you know how people are n- not engaging with their local um conservation clubs and the, things like that i forget the sporting what, club hierarchy and yeah. we just released a version of that uh i just published a new version of that kind of updated and slightly longer on our website okay. so it's out there on on outdoornews.com New I'll York. get the link for that yeah. and I'll put it in sure. the uh, in the notes of the show but that that discussion to me and it's something that kind of ties into a lot of the conservation and the different organizations that are out there I think one of the challenges is right now is that we have your generation my dad's generation they belong to you know shooting clubs uh, sportsmen's clubs where you had maybe property where you all you know, had you were in this club or you had to get into it so you had access to this, but it was a community where everybody came together sure. to one place or you, you know, you had a, 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 a shooting, you know, like Rochester Brooks Gun Club comes to mind in the town that I grew up in where you have hundreds of members and those people are all there. They're, they're educated, they're knowledgeable on what's going on, maybe some of the legislative things that are out there. And people are like, they're together. They, they're in, in person. Now we have this kind of, transition with a lot of the younger generation like myself where it seems like these conservation organizations there's there's one for every every likeness if you are into deer hunting there's one for deer hunting if you're into pheasant there's sure. one for pheasant sure and, and they're all good they're I all mean, good they're, they're, so my point is is that you don't have to go anywhere to be a member of those groups so now you're not you're not showing up to something you're not going when there's a when there's a public hearing on an issue there's nobody going there your, right. your organization supports it or doesn't support it but there's no physical involvement and that was something i kind of took from that from that editorial is that our we've kind of changed as people we're not as personally engaged face to face with a lot of these items and issues that go on in life period Mm -hmm. you you get where i'm going with that yeah yeah Yeah. and people need to become engaged and involved somewhere along the line and that was the entire point of that and uh and i actually I don't want to hear any excuses because I've been doing it my whole life. You and I just had a conversation about how we lead busy lives, and it's by choice. Mm-hmm. But in one of the points I made in that in that editorial was, you've always got the guy who has plenty of time to get to the tree stand on the back forty or get to the bass lake multiple times a week, but they can't take a couple hours, join a sportsman's club, whether it's a fishing game club or it's a chapter of say backcountry hunters and anglers or trout unlimited or whatever it is that interests you. Mm-hmm. And put some time in there for the benefit of that interest as well as the future of the, of especially the kids, of course. But not these days with R3, it goes beyond that. And so much of that has changed and where it really sticks out is at the county federa- federation level. And that's something that I've been involved with for a long time. We have a, a council here in Warren County, the Warren County Conservation Council, which is made up of the fish and game clubs in the county and any organizations that they choose to be. Mm-hmm. Uh, like you said, the organizations, I'm not going to say they're new, but it seems like in the last ten, couple of decades, chapters have become more a more common thing, so to speak. Yeah. And, and there's no reason why they can't be involved or, you know, you can't be involved with them. And, and if they partner with these clubs, then you got a, you got a real winning situation there. Sure. But anyways, our fish and game club, I belong to a fishing game club that has over 600 members. How many do you think show up at a meeting? We have monthly meetings. We're lucky if we get a dozen, Yeah. Uh, maybe 20 sometimes. It depends on what's going on. And that's the same thing you hear with fire departments and uh, churches and, you know, just different. Any Anywhere volunteering is involved, there's less people volunteering. Yeah. And uh, the problem is we need it. I mean, we really, really need it. And Why do you, why do you feel we need it? Elaborate on that. Because 
participation is key. We're represented at the, the sportsmen are represented in Albany based on our numbers. And if you consider the hierarchy of that, for example, I belong to a fish and game club that belongs to a county conservation council. That council, or in your county it might be called a sportsman's federation or whatever, but it's still a county group that represents a sportsman in that county. There's a number of sportsmen, whether they're part of a club or not. These are the people that are going to regional meetings and sometimes state meetings and talking about things like gun laws, chronic wasting disease, future hunting regulations. That in turn, when someone, say, from the New York State Conservation Council goes to Albany to advocate for our interest, there's where the numbers count. Right. And I don't think a lot of people understand that. Mm -mm. And, I, you know, my own hunting crew, we have anywhere from half a dozen to a dozen people on, on a weekend. I think there's two or three of us that are involved in a sporting club. <laughs> You know, I know. I mean, I can't lecture these guys and gals. I can't tell anybody what to yeah. do. I've chose to be involved, and I've chose to be involved since I was in my 20s. Yeah. And it, it's just something I liked. But I've watched our county federation almost disappear. We resurrected it last year coming out of COVID. But even prior to then, we had probably a half a dozen guys running it, and they were all in their 80s. Right. I think there's two of them that are alive now, you know. It, and, and they, those guys did it for years and years, and they finally said, okay, we got to step down. we got to find some new blood. Yeah. But the new blood, I'm the, I'm the youngest one, and I'm in my 50s. Yeah. You know, and, and we're not seeing those younger people. We've got a few coming in in our county, but we need more. We need right from the bottom generation up, you know. I know it's difficult. I, and like I said in that editorial, people have jobs, they have families, they have responsibilities. But on the other hand, they always find time to get to the back 40 yeah. and sit in a tree stand or get on a bass lake. And uh, the thing of it is, is they all have skills, and we need those skills. Yeah. If, if you know how to fly, cast a fly rod, come help somebody else learn how to do that. If you, you know, shooting ranges, uh, whatever, there's, uh, there's so much yeah. need for instruction. Yeah, you know? and, and at the end, it's just so everything's gotten so muddy that, like, you we're all turned off in a way, you know, like you don't want to go and it's just, it's an argument and you feel like you don't have a voice. You don't feel like this, uh -huh. but it's like, it just, it's, I think it's almost like the boy who cried wolf because we've gotten to this point where now look at what, how much has transpired in the last 30 days in this state oh. legal le legislation wise. And hopefully that, that, untranspires. <laughs> right. That has just happened like that. And we're all just like, uh, what happened? Like, we had you. Nobody's prepared for that. And what it, what that does is it discourages people from being involved in the process. But then also, I guess, kind of going back to your point that you were making is that there's no. Um, I am an avid hunter. I'm obviously passionate about this stuff because I put my spare time into doing it. But like, I don't know the process to get involved in my own county uh, federation. Federation. Right. I don't know the local shooting club. Like. We all need to figure out, like, how do you get that next generation of people like myself, like young, you know, the 20-year-olds the right now, to one, get them involved in that. Like, that's, that's something that... One of the problems where a lot of us are guilty is we don't communicate. And I mean that by the groups. They don't, have, they don't even have a Facebook page. They don't have a website. They rely on people just to show up, and, or they hope it shows. So the, yeah. they do have to make an effort. Our council has a, a Facebook page. We have a, a web presence on one of the club member websites. Uh, my Fish and Game Club has an excellent website. You can join the Fish and Game Club through the website. Hmm. Uh, and so, yes, these all the clubs could be more technologi what's the term? Um, technologically advanced. Correct. There you go. <laughs> Thank I'm you. helping you. You're helping me. <laughs> Thank you. I was having a hard time thinking. And uh, so, you know, and, and of course, a lot of folks, and I'm not certainly not picking on the older generation, but a lot of folks aren't savvy when it comes to computers, and they, they don't, they don't want to do that. I know people are adamantly against that. Right. But that is the key to recruiting the, whether it's the millennials, the generation that's one ahead of them, one in back of them. I can't keep track of all of them and the, the nomenclature associated with yeah. it. But, uh, but anyways, it's those people that are 20 years old and up to 45 or 50 that we really need to get involved in this if there's going to be a future for it yeah. and that's again it's the numbers it's it's when a lobbyist goes to albany 
you know, for whether it's the New York State Rifle and Pistol Association or the Conservation Council, and walks in front of Congress and tries to convince them why they should or shouldn't do something, whether it's a new hunting regulation or something that's going to be in our favor, they're talking with people who don't understand what we're about, no. and they have the task of convincing them, and numbers is something that speaks. So when you can say, I represent 20,000 sportsmen in Warren County, you got something going for you. Yeah. you know, and, Or whether you can say, I represent all of the licensed hunters in this state you know that would be nice for them to be able to say that yeah to say that every licensed hunter in this state is a member of such and such an organization yeah to answer your question of how you get involved you got to find that organization or they got to find you um in warren county they just created an individual membership for people who might not be in a club because the meetings have always been open to a pu- to the public mm-hmm. um they're about to draft a letter to the governor opposing the latest batch of gun laws the uh Concealed carry, oh, the CCIA, concealed carry. I'm trying to think of the next word that's in it. It begins with an I. Improvement Act. <laughs> yeah, what's improving, right? Yeah. But uh, but anyways, you know, we're, this council is going to draft a letter opposing that. You know, they passed a resolution at the latest meeting, and they do things like that. And hopefully at least they read that and understand where this group of people is coming from yeah. and understand that other people across the state feel the same way. Yeah. So that's the role that these groups play. And is there arguments? Is there infighting? I've seen plenty of it over the years, and it is a turnoff. I won't lie to you. But uh, at the end of the day, it's about people trying to come together for a common cause. Yeah. And, yeah. You, and as long as you have people that are, you know, right-hearted when it comes to that, then you will – you can you can go beyond the uh, knuckleheads, as I like to call them. Yeah, the people that want to cause trouble or just have their voice heard. Well, in, uh, in open discussion is a good thing. Like yeah. I think, and that's I, I put a ton of my my time and effort into you know I I was very active with BHA for a couple of years, year and a half. Um, I, we do a lot of work for the for the Deer Association through Perkner mm-hmm. Outdoors, raise money for the Venison Donation Coalition, but. And they I've, can sure use it. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm but I'm looking at and I, I hear there's some BS going on with them with the state. Oh, with I don't the donation coalition. But I probably shouldn't talk about it because I don't know the exact details. Sure. But you know, but on the, that end it's like, what's more valuable, my time or my money? You know what I mean? Like am I would I be better off spending my time starting to rain again? Yeah. I'd say a little bit of both. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean. And I think that's the that's the challenge for me because I just want my efforts to be valuable. I want what I'm doing just simply with this podcast. I, w- I don't want to feel like I'm wasting my time, you know, doing this podcast and, you know, saying things. I, I feel like the content is valuable. I feel like the discussions are important. But, like, we're in, we're in important times. Like, yep. not to th- – trying not to be dramatic here, but the things that are happening, the changes that are happening legislatively. And our job as like, media people is to communicate. Yeah. We, it's, it's to tell people what's going on. I mean, that's what – let the truck go by here. Yeah. <laughs> um, nice big rig. I mean, that's how my, my approach to news has always been, even before the, I came to Outdoor News. I worked for a paper here in Warren County, and I felt that it was my duty to tell people things and inform them of things they might not otherwise come across. Right. And, and that's what we try to do in the paper, especially with our news stories, is say, this is what's going on. You need to know about it. Yeah. So hopefully you read it. Um, that's, you know, that's... Well, Point well taken. I mean, you know, because you might not feel like you're like you're making. I mean, I think about all the news I listen. I listen to tons of podcasts. I listen to uh, sure. talk radio, on, but I don't like interact with it. I listen to it, but I don't like message them and tell them sure. my thoughts on it. Or right. and so, hopefully, there are people listening to this, and even if it is a small number of people, it's making an impact. You know, and you're getting this stuff out there. But it just seems like I don't know between the guns, between the climate act stuff, everything that's going on with that. You got hunting regulations that you know these like the whole crossbow discussion. So much energy, and you deal with that at the paper. Yeah, it is it's, it's like every single biweekly paper from you has, has something got something on about, it. and it's like that is the least of our concerns. Like that is so counterproductive to we're, what we're trying to get achieved. And, it, and it's sad that there's so much division on it. Yeah. And, I, and I'm not saying that I'm sad that people disagree with how I feel. It's just it's there's so much vehement division on it. I mean. Uh, and I'll tell and just you, think uh, about the energy that's being used on that. If it was used 
to advocate for hunting. I'm I'm pro crossbow. I'm pro. Yeah, me too. If they had a rock throwing season, I'd support it. Because <laughs> <laughs> I want to see people be able to get in the woods and hunt. Yeah. That's you know, and there's, and I I feel bad for the people that say that they can't. And I understand the people who say, well, there's ways to do it. We just printed a letter from from a gentleman who explained how to use a uh, a, uh, a a locking device so that you can, you know, on on a compound or recurve bow. And I and I understand that stuff exists, <laughs> but it's still the cross the crossbow sitting there. And I'm not going to get into the whole argument, but the yeah. crossbow is one of the most growing things that's happening in the hunting sector, in, and it has been. And you know. You get on board with stuff like that, and I also think that a lot of people who are opposed to it might be for the wrong reasons. If if you're opposed to it because you don't want competition in the woods, then I, I have to disagree with you. Yeah. You know, if you're opposed to it because you've, you've worked hard to become a bow hunter and you feel that it's a lesser weapon, you know, I kind of get that to yeah, a degree. I, I don't it. agree with it, but I understand their perspective. Yeah. But, but at the end of the day, I think there's a lot of selfish people who just don't want competition in the woods. Yeah. And I, I don't agree with that. I, you know, it, it's, I just, I can't, I find it selfish. That's Beca- all. And it's just, I, it, it is, we, we get stuck in this, like, time period that we're in and we feel like everything's always been this way, but it hasn't. That's not what hunting is about. <laughs> hunting is not about how big of a buck you're going to shoot. And there is just a lot of ego that gets wrapped up in that. Absolutely. And, and that's all it is. And there's nothing positive that comes from that. You know, and, and, and in the end, it's like, you know, we've had this discussion on here. It's like you only get so many tags. Once your tags are filled, you're done. You know, and it's like that's the bottom line. Like if you take a more effective implement and, yes, you can maybe you can be more effective killing animals. You're going to do it like that, and you're going to fill your tags, and you're going to be out of the woods and not bother anybody. Yeah, we put scopes on muzzleloaders. We, you know, went from a round ball to a conical to, you know, the different types of le- loads there are today. And it's a short season with a muzzleloader, and, well, it's a real short season for the crossbow, but our archery season is a long season. At least it's longer in the southern zone than it is the northern zone. I hunt the northern zone. I do very little southern zone hunting. Yeah. And I'm trying to change that, but... Uh, that's the way it's been for about the last 20 years for me. And the crossbow season, three days, it just isn't enough, you know, before the <laughs> muzzleloaders come out. No. It, it's, it's almost not even worth the effort. Why, of, why, would, why would anyone buy a crossbow to hunt three days in the right. northern zone? You know, it's, it's, uh, it just doesn't make any sense in the whole muzzleloading requirement for it. But one, I know you want to talk about other things. I just want to say one other thing about the crossbow discussion. Yeah. You know, in, the, in outdoor news, we don't shun anybody's opinion and anyone you know the people who are opposed to crossbows their opinions are just as much valid in my opinion as as anyone's and so we don't tell them that they were not going to print their letters and we ran a commentary that was written by the president of the new york bow hunters association Mm -hmm. and we did a story about them um we wanted the story to be about their anniversary they had i think a 40-year anniversary a 30-year anniversary but the discussion went to the crossbow and that's and so people criticized me for putting that in the paper and i was i was like listen everyone gets a voice here and uh and i'm not going to censor people and if you're asking me to censor people what else do you want us to do i mean do do we really want to go down the road of censorship no and do we want to go down the road of getting wet (laughs) <laughs> I know. Yeah, it's freaking pouring, right? Let's, can we put a pause on this? Yeah, let's, I'm okay. going to get this equipment out of the way. Okay. You can edit this? Yeah. Well, like in a bathroom here, we got, we got reverb. <laughs> reverb. Yeah. yeah, now we've got fantastic quiet audio in here. So we have relocated. That was quite the... Are we recording now? Yeah, we're, we're yeah, on. All right, yeah. you'll edit this out. Yeah, it's... Uh, man, that came down in a hurry. Oh my gosh! Much needed rain. Yeah, much needed rain. So you were in the middle of you know just talking about how yeah, you I'll published wrap, that piece I'll, on. I'll wrap up the crossbow thing with. It was suggested by, and I I did not see the social media post, but someone told me about him. I don't know if it was Twitter, or Facebook. I couldn't tell you, mm-hmm. but uh, there were people taking myself and the paper to task for for publishing the opinions of people who are cross, opposed to crossbows, and I. I just, I can't agree with that either. I mean, people are entitled to their opinions for whatever reason they have them. And uh, we're all sportsmen, and I believe everyone has the right to have their voice heard. That's yeah. why we have an opinion page. That's why we have letters to the editor. Yeah, That's there for people to, to express their views 
whether it's right or wrong, it's it's what they believe. Yeah. And uh, you know, and certainly I scrutinize. Try to get that microphone right. Up, yeah, get that right up there. Certainly, I scrutinize. Uh, you know, in good taste, what might be in good taste. We certainly don't want foul language. You know, we don't want uh, trying to get away from the straight politics of things. You know, people that write in and just hammer on Trump or hammer on Biden or whatever. <laughs> right. Trying to get away from that a little bit and keep the discussion focused on sporting interest. And we did run a letter over the winter here, spring, that was probably borderline. And that might have been a bad decision on my part to do that. The general it had to do with lead ammunition, and uh, it was there was very little about lead ammunition, and it just went on to to hammer politicians in this state and in this country. And um, I'm trying to get away from that. I'd like I'd like to just keep the discussion more. Oh, what's the word I'm looking for? More composed, yeah. <laughs> so to speak. There's plenty of venues to more productive. Yeah, there's pl- there's plenty of avenues to vent politically, you know, and it's got to be hard in your role though, because I would assume that a lot of the a lot of the, you know, the messages and the letters to you and that like a lot of them are probably emotional about those absolutely sorts of things. about whatever anyone is doing. I mean, we're, we got into it last year with the bass up on St. Lawrence. We had a, a commentary that several people disagreed with and. uh Again, they came after me, and I said, "Well, this is this is this particular writer's opinion, and it's on an opinion page, and that's all it is. It's their opinion. It's not the paper's opinion. In fact, there's a disclaimer right there that that explains that. And that's been that's the rule with any form of media when when you have an op-ed or somebody's the option to express themselves. It's not the opinion of the paper or the publication. It's the uh, it's the opinion of the writer. Right. And uh, but anyway, you know, we'll see where the crossbow thing goes. Like you said, there's a lot more now that's overshadowing that all of a sudden. <laughs> do you ever do you ever wonder, in my mind, goes to the cynical side of a lot of this, is that the state knows that this is a huge dividing point between sportsmen and women, the crossbow thing, right? Mm-hmm. And yet again, we go through another legislative session where nothing happens with it. So what it's going to do is it's going to keep that flame lit and it's going to keep us all arguing and fighting and it's just going to keep going. Like, part of me wonders if they like the fact that we're in fighting with each other and taking attention away from the more important issues that are out there. Maybe. I, I, you know, I wouldn't say there aren't people who feel that way. Yeah. But I listened to the, uh, to the meeting that the Environmental Committee had on Crossbow. On the, well, there was a bunch of bills that they were looking at, and, and a couple of Crossbow bills were one of them. Or I should say two of them. There was the distance requirement and then the... Yeah, right. there there was a few things. We have someone coming. And basically what I heard, in my opinion, was some legislators who just didn't want to deal with it. Yeah. Um, the the c- committee chairman is downstate. His constituents don't want it. He feels there's too much division to bring it forward, and he might have a valid point there. But uh, at the same time, there's obviously a lot of support for it, and that's what his detractors said. And we had a front page story on that, and uh, and also a lot of input. And the, some of the politicians who support Crossbow just couldn't believe what they were hearing. They just brushed it aside. They took a bunch of bills that were that, and the, the, the Crossbow bills were two of them, and they just they tabled, shelved, tabled yeah, yeah, you know, till the next time basically. Yeah. And then they moved on. And, uh, and and just think, like one of the things that. So this, you know, the, one of the recent things that's been in the news, sportsman-wise, has been the whole the bill that was put forth by the guy out of Georgia uh, at the federal level to amend the way that Pittman-Robertson funding is funded. Absolutely. And I listened to a podcast um, last week by Chris Rowe, Rowe Hunting Resources, and I really value his – he's a biologist, but he's very animated. He's very energetic about a lot of these, uh, these topics, but he dives into them, and he – He'll give you a different spin on it. He'll give you a different take on it. And all of these conservation organizations, you know, a couple of them with Howl for Wildlife and Sportsman's Alliance come out with their actions. You need to, you know, send these things, click these things to send these messages. But then he spins it and makes you think about it in a different way. And, you know, we look at the situation, bringing it back to our problem here with the crossbow situation is that if we're not, um, if the crossbows will let this go, it all comes down to license sales and funding. That's how our environmental, our wildlife model works here. You know, the, the, depending on how much we get for funding from Pittman-Robertson depends on how many That's licenses right. are sold. 
That's and that's something I kind of learned well from gun that sales from gun sales, gun sales. Ammo we've seen sales, Pittman country. Robertson funds go through the roof over Absolutely. the last over the last 10, 15 years. But it's been there's been dramatic spikes each time there's been a, a an election cycle, right? So Chris was talking about this and explaining how, you know, maybe we need to kind of as outdoorsmen, regardless of where you stand on the two way situation, you know, if we like the way our funding is and we like how we're you know we're taking care of our environment and we're doing what we're doing on the conservation level is that we need to kind of look at these things as a give and take because gun owners there is a ton of gun owners out there and shooters sports you know sporting clays they don't deer hunt they don't pheasant hunt they don't do it. they just go to the range and shoot but every round they buy every gun they buy that funding is going into the pot to support what we're passionate about so if we're not going to stand up and support them in their situations that we're dealing with right now it's the same way. But then well, the, the same could be said for the Dingle Johnson Act in parts because I believe yeah. some of that is a is a tax on boat fuel. Yeah. How many boaters don't fish? And I get that, but yeah. that's what we signed on for in nineteen thirty seven and it's a good program and it's been working for a long time and yeah. I'm not in favor of defunding it. Right. I do understand the concept of considering uh, you know, oil on federal lands. Fine, add it to the pot. But the one thing that the Pittman-Robertson Act does for us, and Dingle Johnson, is it gives us leverage. We There's an old saying, and I remember reading this when I was a young kid, and whether it was outdoor life or field and stream or whatever I was reading, hunters pay for conservation. Mm -hmm. We pay for conservation. And when you look at what that money has done in this state over the years, it's for one, if, if you go to a wildlife management area, chances are that land was purchased with PR money. Yeah. The management for it is done with PR money. The moose aerial surveys in the Adirondacks are done with PR money. They wouldn't be able to do them without it. Yeah. Um, and there's probably all kinds of, they probably support fish hatcheries. Uh, I, I can't, I can't sit here in my mind and break down everything, but I have a hard time believing that that's, that defunding it would be a good thing. No. I understand the point that you're saying about people. I mean, but about people who might go to the range and never hunt who are putting money into this, but have you ever heard them complain? No. Exactly. No. Have you, you know, they've never, and you really don't hear hunters complain because a lot of the money has also gone for things that aren't related to hunting. Yeah. They're gone. The habitat they support might help the whippoorwill or the karma blue butterfly or anything, things that, that we have no interest in, but we're still proud of the fact that we, right. that we made that contribution. And, you know, you hear people talk about a hiking license. How come the hikers don't pay or something like that? Think about what that what might happen if they did, mm -hmm. especially up here where I live in the Adirondacks. I've, I have personally heard people, a very small minority, but I've heard it, who believe that hunting should not be allowed in wilderness areas. <laughs> now, a wilderness area, you may have heard some of the things in the Adirondacks and Catskills. These are land classifications, okay? Mm -hmm. Wilderness is... No roads, there's no motors allowed. Right. Wild forests are a little more lenient. In fact, the Adirondack Park Agency t is looking at examining how many roads, how much motorized access there should be in wild forests. Yeah. Well, there's none in there's none in wilderness areas, and there there is a legion of people out there who would like to see the wilderness areas shut off from hunting. We say, listen, look what we do. Look what we pay for our licenses. We pay for our gear, and there's a tax on that that goes into habitat. You know, mm -hmm. somewhere along the line, there's probably been a few areas, a few bucks pumped into these areas. Yeah. And that's our leverage. And that's that's my belief. Anyways, I, I I'm proud of sure. what we do and the money we've raised. And I think all I think all hunters should be proud. The last thing we should ever do is apologize. No. And, <laughs> and uh, but, but I it's understand an, that it's point. an educational that's piece. Like how many how many people that are out there? We, we just talk in a vacuum. We're talking in a freaking doorway right now. You know, yeah. like people outside of what we're passionate about hunting, fishing, the outdoors, there's, there's a, there's more, there's 10, 15 times more hikers, campers, Absolutely. outdoors enthusiasts, trail runners that have no clue. And they don't understand our lifestyle. They don't understand it because we've moved to a point where more people are moving to city centers. They don't live in the country. They're not sustainable on their own with hunting and farming. That's like that's hard. People can't even comprehend that. Right. The majority of our population in this state and in this country. So now we've gotten to the point where all things are under attack. I mean, when it comes down to it, it's not to be overly dramatic, but this push against 2A is a dramatic 
push against us because if they if they ban the ability to buy some of these weapons, they ban the ability to buy the ammunition, they price it to the point where you can't afford it, that's literally money out of conservation sure. pocket. So it's like, is that legislation a good thing or a bad thing? Because if they're going to, like, we should be opposed to all of it. We should be opposed to the change to it. We should be opposed to, you know, any changes to the two-way regulations because it's an attack on on us and our freedoms and I the agree. way that we live our lives. I think the CCIA and it's not solving is, any problems. I think the, the concealed carry Improvement Act is is nothing but political grandstanding. Oh, and, for and sure. I, I'll stand by that. Yeah. Uh, there's so much to it, and and I encourage anyone, I encourage everyone who's a hunter to read it because they think it's only about handguns, and it's not. Um, I, we were discussing a provision earlier, and if I'm reading it correctly, and I did not hear back from the state police in time to include this in the most recent issue of Outdoor News, but we'll be certainly touching on it is provision in there that pertains to transporting all firearms in, in a vehicle mm-hmm. when you're not in the vehicle. And basically what it says is if you leave any firearm in a vehicle, it needs to be securely locked in a, in a safe that is, among other things, fireproof <laughs> and out of sight. So let's say you and I, you know, you're visiting here in Saratoga and you and I decide, and maybe a couple of your buddies, you're out here in October or something, we're going to go do a little grouse hunting. Right. And we're going to meet, you know, we're going to meet and uh, you're going to hop in one my vehicle and we're going to drive up north and we might stop for, we'll probably stop at a convenience store, get a cup of coffee, uh, maybe go to a diner and have breakfast. Who knows? Uh, stop on the way out. You don't know. But the bottom line is if, if the vehicle is, empt- is vacant from people, all firearms are supposed to be secure. So that means I got to have a safe in my truck somewhere. I don't know where I'm going to put it that can hold yeah. Or guns, if not more. Right. And, and if it, it seems ridiculous, that is it, it's it's, ridiculous. To me, it's the most ridiculous thing in this whole yeah. package. Right. And it's, and it's getting no attention. It's, uh, everybody's talking about the sensitive areas. They're talking about the social media requirement, which I don't see holding, because that <laughs> brings the arbitrary part yeah. of it back in. So that, that's a, to touch on that one. So I understand that that's, um, as a pistol permit, a concealed carry pistol permit holder, as I am, I'm sure you are. I'm not. We don't. Not. My, that's... I am the perfect example of why SCOTUS passed, you know, shot down yeah. New York's may, may carry issue. I, I live in a county where the judge does not issue concealed oh, carry Oh, really? Permits. Okay. Very, you know, and, and it's different so, across. So do you have your pistol permit? I have a restricted permit. So meaning you can't conceal carry? Correct. Huh, okay. I'm supposed to load and unload the gun just like you would any other firearm. Yep. If you know if you're going hunting or going to the range or okay. wherever. Okay, interesting. So and that's interesting because I didn't even know in New York State that you could have a pistol without having a concealed carry permit. That was the whole thing with yeah. the SCOTUS ruling. Okay. It was it leveled the playing field. It took away the ability from one judge to be to, to handle it one way versus the other. In some counties, you know, you have to take some training to get a concealed carry. Right. And That's I'm okay. how my I'm county. Okay with training, I think it's know? great. So Wyoming County, where I live, mm-hmm. we, my wife and I, did it together. We went and took the took the training course. It was outstanding. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, I think it's a great thing, I, and I think that was there's it sixteen six, hours. <laughs> no, it was uh, it was an, it was a one night. I think it was sure. three hours and yeah. then a written test. Right. Um, but it was it was they had a gun instructor there. And it was at a gun club, and we went. There was probably 25 people in the class, and it was great. We, he, they, he went through all the things that you can do, you can't do as a concealed carry holder, the, the legal situations, sure. if you're defending yourself, like what is legal. That's super important. You know? And, and, I, and I, I would, would never disagree with the level of training for, yeah. for any gun handling, you know, whether hunting or personal or anything like that. But – I don't know if 16 hours is needed, and, and I don't know what I'm going to do in two hours at the range. I'm going to run out of ammo probably. Right. <laughs> but, uh, but the social media component, uh, that just brings the arbitrary level back into the discussion because it, prior, it was up to a judge to decide. Now it's going to be up to some bureaucracy to say, ah, this guy, you know, he, he says bad things about the governor. I don't think we should give him a permit. Yeah. And it's going to be decisions like that. Now, I understand what they intend to look for they're looking for trends that and i get that but they can do that now it. everybody gets it you they, know they can do that now right. they can they can look at you all they got to do is go look at your facebook page. well that's what happened with the <laughs> with these last three events that happened every one of them every one of those should have been avoided by looking at the individual doing a background check you know and to me like to me when i hear that they need to run a background check on me 
run a search. Do some research. Have a good Look time. At what, have fun. Yep. But don't... I got nothing to hide. But there's a difference between torturing a cat and killing it on YouTube and posting something about a bill you don't agree with. Like, exactly. there's dramatic differences between that. Like I said, there's going to be an arbitrary component here if this stands, and it's probably not going to be favorable to, no. to people. There's, there's, there's going to be people who are going to be denied, denied permits on their political opinions. You know, uh, sorry, I disagree with the governor. Um... I'm I'm not writing nice things about her at the current time, so I'm probably going to be denied. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I know, but I'm yeah. the safest guy out there <laughs> for real. And that's and that's the uh, when we remove the ability to have this, you know, not even necessarily dissent, but just conversations and criticisms. Like that's how that's how our society was built: is disagreements, coming to terms, meeting in the middle, finding well, what's best for everybody. Well, if you uh, if you're a citizen of Russia right now, you can't you can't uh, criticize the war that mm-hmm. they have going on. And that's this is almost the same thing if if, if they go down that road, you yeah. Know? But so where is it at right now? Like it it, it, it passed, passed. It passed July first, and now people are trying to figure it out, and myself included. And I'm no lawyer. When you try to read this stuff and then write a report on it and try to write an accurate report on it, uh, it can be difficult. And and you so you reach out to resources, and some of the resources aren't quickly. They don't always get back to you quickly, especially when you have They're a holiday busy. involved, yeah. like we had, you know, with July fourth. And even people who I consider important stakeholders, like Larry Larry Becker, who is, uh, you know, thank God for him. Uh, he's a guy out in Western New York who is just a strong advocate for sportsman's issues, and he just sent an email out uh, yesterday, and I have not had a chance to read it yet, but it's it's about a four page email breaking down all of these things. And at the top of the email, he says, "Listen, I'm no lawyer, I'm no attorney, and this is my take on it, but." The best thing anyone can do is read the legislation themselves. And I always say that about anything, whether it's the deer management plan or the fisheries management plan, anything that comes up where there's a document that needs to be read, I encourage you to read it, not just the press release or what I, you know, what I do a lot of times is take the press release and dig through it and clean it up a little bit and include some of the finer points, but then get somebody some opinions you know you never know it's all it all depends on what extent of reporting you're going to go through through for a particular issue but when it comes to the big stuff like the deer management plans and things like that in legislation we try to get some some input you know we try to have some people weigh in on it and uh but i always say to the reader read the plan don't Mm -hmm. just take my word for it we've incoming but Uh, it is also extreme i will say as someone who Oh, it's difficult to it's, read this stuff. It's difficult to read the stuff, and it's difficult to find the time to read it. It's very valuable yeah. to have the And pa- our job the paper, is to summarize right? it and try to try to help you through it. But I always say, hey, sit down and check it out for yourself. If you're, really, you if you're passionate yeah, about yeah. it and you really want to yeah. do that. But, yeah, so I think it's at this point, from what I understand, from what I've listened to, is that it's going to be someone has to file a lawsuit against the state similar to what just happened. Gun Owners of America just launched one yesterday. Okay. Uh, at least I saw an email about that, but when I went to their website, I could not find a report on it. Uh, Amoland.com reported on it, on that. And it's uh, it's Gun Owners of America. It's another group, and it's a Ukrainian immigrant who are the plaintiffs, and they're suing no the state police. Yeah. Okay. Yep. And it's so just, suing the state police. So what? Because they're the ones charged with enforcing the law. Okay. Um, it's... You know, they're, and I, I, I got to believe that the state police, like, as you and I discussed earlier, most of them probably are, are, are gun owners and Second Amendment people, but they also work for the governor. Oh. <laughs> so it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's, anyways, that was the case in the Bruin case, you know, Bruin was state police. And, mm-hmm. uh, but that's cases arisen. I'm sure the Second Amendment, Amendment Foundation is going to get involved here at some point. They seem to have a real good track record. When it comes to these lawsuits, uh, they've got them going in California. They've done real well against micro stamping. Mm-hmm. I can't believe we passed a micro stamping law in this state when one just got overturned in another state. But that's come on, you can believe it. Come on, uh, I guess yeah. I can believe yeah. it. Disappointed, not surprised. It's um, I'm just, nothing surprises me at this th- point. You know, if it seems like it could, it probably will. And you know, the whole thing about all of this is, and, and I take this personally, I really do, is the disrespect. You know, they, one of the things the SCOTUS case said is, the ruling said is, you can't treat people like 
gun owners like second class citizens. But that's exactly what I feel like right now. Yeah. When you're telling me that to go deer hunting, I've got to lock my gun up if I go in to buy a cup of coffee. If uh, you're gonna, you want me to tell you about all of my social media accounts, and uh, so you can be Big Brother, and you're worried about me carrying a gun in certain places. I'm not your problem, and and you know I don't feel that a lot of these the items that are in the CCIA are going to solve any problems in terms of mass murders or because so many concealed carry permits are already issued in New York. And that's the point I make in my next editorial that's in the current issue is what we already have to go through just to get a permit, whether you get a concealed carry permit in your county or a restricted permit in my county. We've still got to go through a background check, a next check actually, fingerprints, uh, four references. By the time they get done, they know oh, they what know they everything need to know about that they you. Should, they, should, they should know everything they and, need and, to know about you. And nothing changes with that. You know, if you talk to Tom King, the president of the New York State Rifle and Pistol Association, when this case was coming up, he says, we're not trying to change that. You know, that, that the permit process wasn't going to change. It was just, if you get a pistol permit, you have a right to ask for it to be concealed carry. Yeah. And that's it's a pretty simple thing that just became a lot less simple <laughs> with the passing <laughs> of this CCIA. Dude, we're, we're only, <laughs> you and I, we've spent 25 minutes talking about what just happened in the last 10 days. Yeah. There was yeah. a legislation that was passed a month and a half ago that is just as complicated yeah. and just as harsh on... Micro stamping, uh, the... The semi-automatic. The semi-automatic rule, which, you know, I, I have... One of my best friends from high school is the undersheriff in the county I live in. And uh, I just asked him, I said, what's this going to do to you guys, you know, in terms of... Now, now you gotta you got to go through the same process for certain semi-automatics that you go through for pistols. He says, we got two people on our pistol permit staff. <laughs> He says, I think and we're going to have the volume of people that have and this is a, rifles. And this is a county that isn't exactly steeped in, uh, in uh, resources. resources. You yeah. know, it's, it's very rural. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like most county, like most of New York counties. You know, not every county has Lake George or Saratoga or New York City or, you know, something that, that uh, offsets the, the average tax bill. Um, these, are, these are counties full of people just, you know, working every day. To, to make a living and, and there's very little extra, you know, extra money for any program. So now they've got to hire possibly two people in an age where trying to just find people that want to work is half the battle, you know. So none of it's, none of it's making any sense. No. And, uh, and you, you know, one of the things I asked in my editorial when I was talking about that was, okay, you're doing all this. Now what happens if and when it doesn't work? Okay, so it's just the beginning. They're gonna, they're going to chip away. They go, well, we didn't do enough. We didn't do enough. They they keep we didn't do enough. They keep I mean, saying Dan, that they over just, and they over. just passed that legislation, yeah. and it hadn't even had a chance for the the new legislation in June to pass or to actually go into effect. Yeah, and then we already have an emergency session called, and they're ramming through yeah. new gun control stuff over a shooting that happened that was disgusting and awful and never should have happened. And and then just wait a few days and here's another one, you know. And it's in these stories they just keep stacking on each other and it's opportunities for. And, and I don't have the answer for stopping we mass don't. shootings. No. Uh, and I and I don't believe anyone does, including the people who feel we need to pass gun bills. Um, I'm not a psychologist or a sociologist, but something has changed in, in the way people treat each other. And uh, you know why does the this 18 year old kid want to kill people? Um, why, you know, why do they do things like you say to cats? Why do these people do these cruel things? We've had semi-automatic firearms around that have the ability to handle a multi-capacity magazine for as long as I can remember. And I think it was in the mid-80s, late 80s, I started seeing them advertised in magazines. They started to become a little more popular, and then eventually they were banned by the Clinton gun, the Clinton gun ban. And they came back around, and Columbine happened during the Clinton gun ban. Yeah. My, and the other point I always make is these people that want to do bad things are going to find a way to do them. Yeah. And, uh, you know, if they, if they really want to get their hands on a gun, there's a black market out there. And it's and my point is always it's, it's not you and I they need to worry about, you know, with our with our handguns it's or even our hunting guns. It's, it's, it's this culture that has no respect for human life. Right. And, and I don't have the answer. I'm not going to sit here and say that I do. 
Well, like, I think that's why yeah. that's why we just see the the knee jerk legislation because it's easier to do that than it is to yeah. figure out this problem that no one truly has an easy button to hit. And it's probably a long term solution. And well, if you're a politician, you're not interested in anything in the long term, especially when an election is four months away. Right. You know, that's not very long term. If it, it could take 10, 15 years to figure out or to right the wrong, um, if it's, you know, whether it's you're looking at mental health or society, whatever, you know, there's so many things people point to and, uh, and they're all valid, but, but I just don't believe that, uh, guns are the issue. No, I don't either. I don't. don't. Um, and the one thing that I would, I would recommend to people is to, you know, I've listened to several, several people speak on the, on the statistic end of things of, of the gun violence and that. And that's been one of the huge things that's been politicized, obviously, over the last three months, four months, as these awful events have happened, is you've had statistics thrown out there about all these things, how many shootings there are, how many, you know, how many uh, kids are killed with guns. And these statistics are all spun to tell a story, every one of them. And whether you're pro, pro supporting it or pro or if, whether you're for gun control or against gun control, you, you will spin the numbers however you need to to analyze it. But it's important still yet to understand where those points mm-hmm. are coming from and how they're putting that data together. One of the shocking things that I heard is, you know, you hear the, the crazy number of, of school shootings. You know, the, when we had the school shooting at Uvalde, data comes out and says, well, yeah, it's a huge problem. There's been, I don't know, have numbers. Hun- you know, let's just say hundreds of, school shootings, right, in the nation in this period of time. But you look at how they're analyzing what a school shooting is, it's within a range, a radius of the school. And then the age of a child, if it's 19 years old, is the age of a child. The majority of gun violence is happening in inner cities. Sure. It's happening with 17, 18, 19-year-old kids. And they're all considered kids in those statistics. And what you have going on is you have... You have a story being built that when you read that headline or that first paragraph of a, of a story, it's like, oh, my God, there's that many murders and shootings that happen in a school zone. But they're looking at it in a, in a radius. So you take a populated area like the city of Rochester has got they have a bad gun problem right now with with gun violence. There's it's a lot of it's every night you turn on the news in the morning. There's another Sh- shooting. Chicago Junior. Yeah. 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 And and it's there. But there's schools. There's 20 schools peppered throughout the city. So if every one of those things that happened is considered a school shooting, it's like, what are we, the data is not, is not telling you what the true problem is. I don't know what year it was. I want to say 2013 or somewhere around there. The New York Bar Association came out with a report on mass shootings at the time. And uh, basically they concluded, if I remember right, that they're almost impossible to stop because you can't control that person that crosses that line and figures out how to get a gun legally or not a person who otherwise never showed any signs of doing anything, you know, to harm somebody suddenly does. And, uh, but the one thing they pointed out was most of your gun deaths are suicides. Yeah. And look who is trying to do something about suicides, the national shooting sports foundation. Hmm. They have an anti-suicide campaign going and it's, and it's a good one. And they also have project child safe, which is a program to educate kids to, how to react if they're if they're around a gun, you know what what to do, and and of course parents in the house how they should handle firearms, and and I'm not 100 percent opposed to safe storage of firearms where kids are concerned. I was raised in a household where I had a BB gun and I grabbed it, you know, every Saturday morning as soon as I got out of bed and ran around right. the, the woods where I live now and uh, terrorized the local local red squirrel population. <laughs> and <laughs> but, you hear that you hear that story over and over again. Yeah. And I grew up in a household where we didn't have a gun safe. We didn't have hey. dad, you know, we had guns of they we had a we had a closet in the upstairs sure. bedroom that had a lock on My it. My dad key, had a gun rack. Had and, the key and it was it was essentially a big gun safe except it didn't wasn't made out of metal. My BB gun, you know, if I misused it, it got taken away. Right. And like, but I think that's the difference you know, is like is that there was a respect very early on, and I'm trying to instill that in my son right it's, now. It's not a toy, right? right. I got it's him a, a little a little wood Fire gun right. that's freaking adorable. I got it at the gun shop out my way. It's a it's a wood gun. It has no trigger on it. It's just wood, and it's got a bolt on it. Sure. And it's just it's I don't know how old this thing is. The guy gave it to me. I told him I was like, hey, 
how much you want for this? He's like, what are you doing with that? I'm like, give it to my son. He's, he's three and a half. He's like, just take it. He goes, that's yeah. great. But you can use but that to teach it. him. He's carrying it. He's working on it. He carries it sure. to the side. He puts it over his shoulder. You can teach him yeah. not to point it at people. Right. You, you, can, you, know, you can start instilling those lessons at a young age. And that's, you know, my dad killed his first buck when I, on my fourth birthday. And I still have that mount in my house. It was his first year. That's cool. And he killed it with a, a Winchester Model 94 44 Magnum. So I had to have a gun just like dad's. You know, so I remember there's pictures of me at Christmas time that year. I don't remember it, but I had a little toy <laughs> Winchester gun. No <laughs> it kidding. looked just like dad's gun, you know. And uh, That's great. Yeah, that's, and like I said, when I was eight years old, nine years old, I had a BB gun. And again, if, if we misused that privilege, there was, there was uh, consequences. Mm-hmm. And I'm not saying that's not the case today. I'm just saying I was raised in an environment where, Oh, uh, where was I? I'm, I'm not raised, so, I, raised in an environment yeah, that I, I I was raised in an environment where where guns were part of our lifestyle, and uh, so was the safe use of them. It was just part of what we did. It was part of our culture. It was part of being in rural America. And I I don't have children, but if I did, I'd raise them the same way. If they were interested in guns, yeah. you know, if they weren't, they weren't. That would. You know, and going back to the you know gun gun culture in this company or this country goes back to our independence. We sure. wouldn't be an independent country if we didn't have weapons. So like that's a that's something to always go back to and remember. We just celebrated the Fourth of July, and sure. so many people are they don't they don't comprehend that. You know, we were we were a society under control from another country, and we fought for the right mm-hmm. to be on our own and to make our own constitution and have our own rights and, and there is an old saying if it wasn't for the second amendment there wouldn't be a first no and uh i believe that i believe, I believe it too that. but uh sadly this is where we're at you know this is uh this is where we're at and we all we can do now is sit back and see where it goes and uh what we'll be doing with the paper is trying to keep people up to speed on it you yeah. know as best we can as things develop but uh yeah it's where we are today and it's it's important to be informed and educated and you know, everybody has a right to their opinions. That's it's what part of us living in this country is all about. So you just got to kind of, you know, understand that. And I think we've I think we've hammered on the the gun stuff pretty well. And, and I and I I would encourage you know that's one of the reasons why I enjoy the paper. Whether it is you guys get into all sorts of topics, you know, and it and it some of it's seasonal. You know, it goes mm-hmm. through. You know, you're getting two papers a month. So you're getting a lot of information. And it's, it's keeping, it keeps me abreast to what the big issues are in our state. And it helps because, you know, if you only get your information from social media, it's whatever's put right in front of you, but then you get the paper and that's a cure, you know, it's a curated collection of information that's there. But my favorite piece by far of the paper is the, is the opinion spot from people, you know, they write their little blurbs in about what they think about this or that, or what's got them fired up. That's my favorite part. My history with New York Outdoor News goes back to the first year. I was fortunate to be one of the early writers that uh, Steve Pyatt, the editor for so long, uh, re- recruited to pitch in once in a while. But I was still an avid, avid reader. And, and like you, I would start with the letters most of the time because uh, I wanted to know how other sportsmen were feeling. Mm-hmm. And I still want to know that. And uh, and I look forward to when I see in my my email there's a – you know, whether it comes through the interface, it'll say a letter to the editor. I, I know, you know, what I've, what I've got in front of me. And there's <laughs> always that, uh, that anticipation. Okay, what's this one about? What's, this, you know, one what's this guy got to say or this gal or whatever? And, and you just never know. You, you never know. And, and, uh, and people have a lot of different uh, lights to shine on certain issues. And, and you step back and go, hmm, I never thought of that. You know, good for them. And uh, it's, it's, it, again, it's all... People just see things from a different perspective, and you have to respect that. Yeah. Yeah, and it might change the way you look at things, so it's, it's very beneficial to, to do that. Um, what, so we, we were talking in the truck there before we, it, while it was the first uh, downpour came through. What, uh, where, so what's the best way for people if they aren't subscribing to the paper? Um, and there, you said there are some, you know, there's some advancements and some changes coming to how you guys will – get things out there, but as of today, yeah. you know, that's... Uh, yeah, the, we, I mean, they've done, taken... There's been some steps recently, I should say, not not 
totally recently, but in the past year or so to uh, enhance the digital subscription. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's definitely a good way to go. If you don't mind reading the paper on your phone or on your laptop or, or tablet or whatever. And it's also, you know, you don't have a, a piece of newspaper kicking around, but there's so many people that like to have that. They like to hold that written recently, recent year, I should say to enhance the digital product. So if, you subscribe using a cell phone or a tablet or laptop, desktop, whatever. It's uh, it's a little little better experience, and and I think we're seeing those numbers go up a little bit, and we we definitely want to see more of that in the future. But there's still people out there that want that printed product. They want to hold that newspaper in their hand, yeah. and they want to read it, and then they want to they want to pass it on to somebody or show somebody this article or this picture. Or whatever, especially if they've uh, sent in, say, a reader shot. We mm -hmm. encourage, re we love the reader shots. People send in pictures of their, their bucks and their turkeys and their fish and, you know, trapping. We'd like to see more of that type of stuff, small game that we don't get to see as much as we used to. But they send the reader shots, and if they play that role, then they want to share that with somebody. So I think there's always going to be a demand for the printed paper. Um, but get to answer your question, hit the website. And you can subscribe there one way or the other. If you don't get the paper, it, then that's where it, I would say to start is go to outdoornews.com, yep. hit the subscription button and find New York State, and, and there you go. And uh, sometimes there's package specials. I think they had a special where you got $5 off if you subscribe for two years or something like that. Uh, yeah. I can't, I and can't it's, remember. And it's not expensive. No, it's $27 degree. a year. It's yeah. basically, you know, a, almost a two bucks a month or something like yeah. that. So it's a, and you're getting two papers. You're yes. Two papers a month. Yeah. It's so. literally a dollar an issue on and give, a, you know, give or take a little more, but uh, that's the best way to subscribe. I think is to go online, but if you get your hands on a paper, there's always a subscription form in the paper. Yeah. It's, there's always one there. Yeah. And I mean, that's a big reason why I want wanted to get you on here is because I just think that that what you, what you have with the paper. And I said this the last time I had you on, is that I just think it's so important for outdoorsmen to have this information at their fingertips to know and have their finger on the pulse because if you aren't, as we just started this discussion, if you're not interested in being that engaged and being in a conservation club or a fishing game or your local federation, if you're not interested in that, at least have something like this where you are informed on what the, the hot issues are so you can be an informed voter, you can be an informed citizen and, and user of the resources that we enjoy and sure. love, you know. Sure, And we we do try to keep people informed. I mean, the first third of the paper is news, and, and that's very important. And we try to share things from all over New York. And one of the criticisms I get is, well, there's not enough on wherever you happen to live. Yep. If people live up north in the Adirondacks, well, there's not enough on the Adirondacks. If people live down in South Westchester County, well, there's not enough on southeastern New York. And I'm like, everybody says that to me. <laughs> Yeah. We, yeah. we can't control the news we where want it comes regional from. papers okay yeah. that's what we need yeah. we, we can't control the news and where it comes from we've got a story coming up on a shark season closure on Long Island you know we have a we have a strong readership on Long Island yeah so that's something for that area um, that's we'll have a report on that in the next paper not the current issue but that's one that's that we got assigned to Charlie Wittick down there who does a great job he's very uh, up on fisheries and that's just an example of that's what's happening down there. Yeah. Um, the, of course, things like the gun laws and all that stuff, that's all That's all statewide. You know, that's something statewide. Right. Pause. Come on in. Yep. We were trying. You're, you're good. You're good. So, so we don't control where the news comes from, and we don't obviously pick news because it's you know if we think we've had too much news from one area and not enough from another yeah. <laughs> the news happens where the news happens yep. and uh you know if, if dc is you know fixing up uh doing some work in a wildlife management area or releasing a unit management plan for a particular area then we try to report on it especially if there's a public comment period that people you know can chime in and say this is how i feel about it sure. and it's not just people from the area it might be somebody that's utilized that place their entire life they might have grown up there and they return back to it once in a while mm -hmm. so we you know there's there's a lot of moving parts there and and uh again we don't control that the features that we do that we assign to our writers we try to have some of them be localized but uh we also get a lot of you know how to 
you know, whether it's something about reloading or cutting the gun, yeah, you're cooking, cooking stuff yeah, whatever. That's general. But I, I do try to encourage our feature writers to, hey, give me something on uh, Chautauqua Lake or give me something on the cat's gills or, you know, obviously with our northern zone preview that's coming up and our bear preview that's coming up, we're going to talk a lot about the areas where bear, bears are hot or, you know, when we do northern zone, that's going to be the Adirondacks. Right. But uh, in the southern zone, we there's a lot to cover there. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, But we, we do a bear special, and so you've got southeastern New York where bears are very prominent, the Adirondack region, Allegheny. Um, but the southern zone bear population has grown quite a bit. So we'll see what comes out of there. We've got a couple – um, articles assigned in that. We'll see what DEC has to say. That'll that's always interesting to sit down with Jeremy Hurst, who is the you know chief big game unit leader in with DEC. He's always got some very good information to share ahead of these seasons, and uh, I always find that stuff really informative. I I love talking with biologists and foresters. I I just do because they I always learn something, and it's always good information to share it. And when you take guys like Steve Hurst, who's the Bureau of Fisheries Chief and Jeremy Hurst. I don't believe they're related. That's was, funny. Was, I, yeah. I was wondering that. <laughs> yeah, you know, when you talk with these guys, they're a wealth of knowledge. And uh, and it's just good information. And you look forward to passing on and yeah. sharing it with people. You can't wait to write the story. Pause. <laughs> this is this is hands down the most interesting place I've ever done a podcast. <laughs> I'm seriously. I, I should have just invited you up to my house. It would have taken another 40 minutes. but No, it's fine. But uh, we could have just sat there into peace and we'll quiet. We'll forever remember this. Yeah, Dan Ladd. <laughs> you should take a picture. We we will take a picture <laughs> before we're done. But uh, but yeah, there you know. So I always look forward to to speaking with DC, and the, the fall issues are coming up, and they're always always fun ones to work on mm-hmm. because I'm I'm a hunter first and foremost. So I look forward to deer season more than anything, and I start in late September with the with the uh, northern zone archery season, and I hunt when possible right on through to sometimes into the southern zone muzzleloader. Yeah. Now January, yeah. Well, I said earlier I don't do a lot of southern zone hunting, and that's primarily on purpose, just because I stick to the northern zone. But uh, with that new season, I'll tell you what: last year during Christmas week, it was forty degrees, forty-five degrees. There were yeah. a couple nice days, and I was like, "Man, would I like to get out after <laughs> I get done working for a couple hours, or on the weekend?" And I really didn't have any place to go. I don't, I don't have that private honey hole, you know, that where I can go. I'm trying to set something like that up. There are some state lands, but it's quite a drive. Yeah. And, uh, so I just didn't do it. And I had a project going on anyways, but boy, I said, I got to do something about this for next year because I had a muzzle loading tag in my pocket. I, ha- I could apply for antlerless deer permits in certain areas if I had access. So that's something I'm trying to do something about myself. And uh, well, we'll see what happens. We got a few irons in the fire, but yeah, but it's creeping up on us here. It is, <laughs> yeah. And that's so we're you know it's mid July here. By the time I'll get this posted, and I think you know I think what we should do is we should absolutely. This was I, these are the things I wanted to cover. I wanted to get you on here to get the pulse of your end of the world on some of these sure. the legislation that's been on here. But maybe we try to get together. You know, end of end of August, um, heading into September as we're looking at the. Maybe we'll dive into the northern zone and have a yeah. discussion about that first, and then let's, we could talk about some deer drives. Yeah, deer drives and and that sort of stuff because really, the, you know, the the archery portion of the northern zone is very short. Sure. And then you get right into, uh, you know, you get right into gun season early in uh, in October there. So we can uh, we can do that, and then maybe we we do something. You know, I, I always enjoy some of the columns that are written by, you know, like Oak Duke and mm-hmm. his stuff is always sure. good on the rut and the, and the anticipation of what some of the dates are going to be. So we'll be bringing back the rut tracker. Yep. Um, that's something that we concocted the first year that I was with the paper. We wanted to do something different during the rut, have it more timely, have something that was uh, conducive through the process of it. So we start about mid-October and we go right through Thanksgiving yeah. and, and uh, each each paper those four papers oak duke analyzes where things are at and he gets a big charge out of it 
he does a good job. It's a different take than some of the other guys who do rut, rut predictions. And but it's uh, it's local, and that's what I exactly. love about it is that and I can it's, compare. It's timely. it's timely, and I can compare what I'm reading from what he's either predicting or reporting. Which he does, he'll predict what's coming and also mm-hmm. report what's happened. Yeah, and you can compare that to what you've sure. experienced out in the field too. And the only thing he can't control that anybody can't control is the weather. Right. You just who knows, you know, and. Anyone who's ever made rut predictions, I used to follow Charlie Alzheimer regularly. Sure. Uh, Charlie was someone I looked up to. I met him a few times and, and spoke to him a few times. I can't say I knew him or was his friend, but uh, but I I definitely valued his opinion on the rut, and I used to look forward to his accounts every year. Mm-hmm. And uh, and he, the first thing he'd say is, you can't do anything about the weather. Nope. Especially when it's warm. Yep. And that's what we had last year, but we'll talk about that the next time. We will. <laughs> well, this place is getting busy, and I got to head her south so I can get ready for sure. my next work event. I appreciate you having so, me on. Uh, yeah, it's, it's always nice to talk uh, to talk with folks. I love doing podcasts, talking about the paper, and talking about what's going on in the outdoors. Yeah. It's, always, it's always a pleasure. Yeah, and I appreciate you. appreciate what you do, and I know it's a lot of hard work. Doing the job you do, and it, it helps educate and inform a lot of people. So we appreciate what you do. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me on, Bill. You're welcome. Thank you. And good luck for whatever the heck you're going to be doing the next two months, chasing something, (laughs) I'm sure.